Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This was the passage chosen by William Babcock, who you can see on our big board about halfway over on the second panel. Right? Yeah, go point. By William Babcock, right there, for his last and accidental farewell sermon. Now, I suspect that this was not the text that he had planned to preach on that morning and that it was probably chosen in anger and in haste. The church was closed to him. The constable was on the way. His prominent and radical friends were standing with him, along with, no doubt, a few members of this church and a number of striking workers and other people from town. In fact, Babcock claims that it was the second largest gathering here, second to the dedication, which we heard about two weeks ago. Now, they probably had a key, or they broke in. Either way, whatever Babcock had planned for the morning obviously would not work out now. So he took for himself this text from Matthew, part of the parable of the rich man, and one that he felt would take the parish committee, the congregation, and the larger community to task for choosing to keep quiet about the important issues of their day, to scold them for hiding their heads in the sand, so much so that the regular pattern of worship was disrupted. You see, even then, our religious liberalism could be a two-edged sword. On the one hand, we have a theology that allows for a broad range of beliefs and perspectives, one that naturally leads people towards ideas of inclusion and acceptance. And thank God for that. This breadth has given us the strength to explore concepts that otherwise we would have never encountered. We are safe here at Elliott to examine the nature and or the existence of the divine without having to worry about our position and status in the community and congregation. We can disagree, we can argue, but we can still gather together with all of our diversity in this same place at this same time. This is the broad church goal. Resting in the words of the transcendentalist Frederick Henry Hedge on a foundation of stability and progress, ideal and ritual. And in a church like this one, we take that foundation seriously. However, it does cut the other way too. This broad theology sometimes lacks in accountability. Liberalism, intellectual liberalism, religious liberalism, sometimes has trouble narrowing itself down, grabbing hold of an issue which perhaps cannot be or should not be discussed to death, and then finally choosing a side. There are times when our perspectives, as liberal and broad-minded as we believe them to be, and we do, There are times when those perspectives are not as objective as we would like to think, but are instead grounded in our own biases, our own earthly needs that remain unexamined and unacknowledged. And interestingly, the issues that we struggled with back then in 1860 are the same sorts of issues that we struggle with today. Racism. Classism, sexism, all rear their heads, then as now. Now here's a little more background on why those doors were shut. You see, religious liberals in general, and Unitarians in particular, 
during that time had a problematic relationship with those very issues that I mentioned, race, class, and gender. Unitarianism was the religion of the Boston elite. The first, not the last, in Jesus' quote. And the Boston elite owned the shoe factories and the textile mills, which relied on raw materials from the slave South and relied on the exploitation of women, children, and immigrants in our northern factories to take the daily risks of running the machines and occupying the dying rooms. A passage like the one in Matthew to this congregation back then might have sounded just fine in the abstract, but a little less fine in the reality of daily life. Now today, Unitarians like to look up to abolitionists like Theodore Parker, who supported John Brown and who wrote his sermons with a loaded gun on his desk. Or Charles Russell Lowell, who we talked about last time, risking his comfortable parish to preach abolition. But most Unitarians weren't like that. Not the ministers and not the members. In fact, the only time a minister of this church is mentioned in the biography of the abolitionist Theodore Parker is when James Thompson, our first minister on the first panel, and I have his ordination service if you want to look at that. When James Thompson, who was then the minister serving in Salem, refused to exchange pulpits with Parker as he was in the process of writing in Thompson's words, a letter to you on some of your heresies for publication. You see, it wasn't just this church. It was a whole movement, an entire class of New Englanders who preferred to look the other way rather than make a stir or judge the slave-based economy that they could quietly condemn from afar in the comfort of their parlors, but which ultimately made them or a family member or a pew mate, very rich. Now, one of the things that probably frustrated and embarrassed Babcock was that everyone else knew about this problem that the Unitarians had. The activist, poet, and hymn writer, Lydia Marie Child, once condemned one of Babcock's predecessors to this pulpit, and therefore one of mine, as a mere feeder on husks and condemned the congregation as being dead while they live. Talk about zombies. More generally, during one of the many smaller conflicts around the issue of slavery that led to the Civil War, Garrison's Liberator newspaper that we've already heard once published these words. The bells of the Orthodox, the Methodists, and the Universalist churches of Waltham told when the news was received, but the bell on the Unitarian church being clogged with cotton would not sound. Now we here today can take some comfort in that Universalist bell, and even in the Orthodox bell, because they didn't mean Eastern Orthodox. This was New England in the 19th century. They meant the Orthodox or Trinitarian Congregationalists. And we are the inheritors of their tradition as well. But on that day, in February, in 1860, when the minister had to break into this very room, the Congregationalists and the Universalists were worshiping elsewhere. And they were only represented by people like the pacifist, abolitionist, and universalist minister, Aidan Ballou. Babcock didn't need his friends, Garrison or Ballou, to help him, of course. He had his own critique of the church. They want a shrewd minister, he said, who can keep the parishioners united by pleasing the rum sellers and the drunkard the Unitarians and the Trinitarians, the progressives and the conservatives, the Jews and the Gentiles, the oppressor and the oppressed. They want the same pleasant ambiguity and unmeaning utterance of words at the pulpit as at the choir end of the meeting house. 
Now, I should say that as the current minister of this congregation, I think we're doing better. And I'm not just saying that to keep you from locking me out. I do have a key. We've learned a lot over the years. And most of us are able to see where we have fallen short in our own beliefs, enough to understand that there is plenty for each of us to learn and plenty of room for improvement. But as a liberal Christian, as someone who cares a great deal about our churches, about our institutions and the people who inhabit them, I do worry. I worry when our gift for seeing all sides, our talent for compromise, our general kindness may keep us from planting our flag, from saying what should be said because it may be misunderstood or because it may be offensive or heretical to someone. Now, a few weeks ago, we read that quote from G.K. Chesterton about orthodoxy. Some of you will remember it. He said the heretic was proud of not being a heretic. It was the kingdom of the world, the police, and the judges who were heretics. The heretic, Chesterton said, was orthodox. I worry that we do not appreciate our own personal, our own heretical orthodoxies enough. One of my professors once told me that the worst thing that can happen to a church is for God to become merely interesting. For God to become merely interesting. Now we have plenty of seminarians here today, and I think he got it from somewhere else, so you can tell me after. But the point is, our faith has to have some sort of hold on us. It is a way of life not just a point of interest, an intellectual exercise. It exists for more than our personal edification. It must motivate our actions. And for Babcock, God wasn't merely interesting on that day, but active. There was an orthodoxy that was important to him, and he picked his text from Matthew for a reason, to inform his congregation for one last time that even in the wide open world of religious liberalism, there are moments when a call to something greater must be heard. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. But it can be hard to accept that call, can't it? It's hard for me. It's hard to accept that call and to accept what it may mean for us. It is a difficult and humbling thing to, in Babcock's words, be criticized and searched to see if business or politics or home has any evil way in it. I wish I had some clear answer at this point for us, some tidy final lesson that would wrap up this sermon, to draw from this story about us and about the struggles we face in living a life that is good and worthy, as faithful and as open as we can. But I don't have a clear answer. Maybe all that we can do is know our history without polish and without spin, and commit to do better, empowered by what is best in our tradition, while being aware of those all too human shortcomings that we possess and that we face every day. Amen.